presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. About 84 million Americans volunteer with a charity, but does it do any good? Maybe the way to combat poverty and hunger America is to turn the problem on its head and remake the nation's nonprofits. And the man who wants to take us down that road joins us next. Stay tuned. Dialogue. I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us here on Idaho Public Television, on the World Wide Web, and on public radio stations. It's a sad fact that there are now more poor people in America than there have been at any other time in the last 52 years. 15% of Americans fall under the official poverty level, and Idaho is certainly not immune. It's estimated that over 50,000 Idaho families worry that they can't afford to buy food. The problem of hunger is no stranger to Robert Eger. Back in 1989, he and his soon-to-be wife were helping a church group feed the homeless in Washington, D.C. when he was struck by a revelation. His nightclub businesses and others like that threw out tons of food each year. But at the same time, church groups and other nonprofits actually paid for food to distribute to the homeless. So Eger founded the D.C. Central Kitchen. Today, the kitchen recycles 3,000 pounds of food each day, converting it into more than 4,500 meals. The staff provides breakfast, counseling services, and its culinary training program teaches unemployed adults who are overcoming homelessness, addiction, and incarceration, and prepares them for work. Sixty other cities across the nation have started similar programs, but Edgar just didn't want to rethink how to feed the homeless. He wants to revolutionize the entire nonprofit community. In his book, Begging for Change, The Dollars and Cents of Making Nonprofits Responsive, Efficient, and Rewarding for All, he makes the case for overhauling the way nonprofits operate and challenges the way we should look at issues like hunger and poverty. Robert Eger is in Idaho as the keynote speaker at the Idaho Nonprofit Center's statewide conference, and he joins me now, sir. Thank you for being here. A pleasure, Joan. Well, let me, let's, let's jump right into if one in six Americans today are hungry, that was the problem that got you started in that nonprofit world, so maybe we should start there. Tell us how that issue attracted your attention. You were running a nightclub when you yeah, started. Yeah, I mean, all I wanted to do was open the greatest nightclub <laughs> in the world. I saw Casablanca as a kid, and that's all she wrote. Um, but two things struck me. I went out one night. Now, I was a reluctant volunteer. I'm somewhat of a recovering hypocrite in that I spoke for, for, for a long time about the power of music to bring people together, yet I'll be honest with you, I really avoided volunteering as long as I could. But the night I went out first was the food part, you know, the sense of I noticed that the group had bought it at one of the most expensive stores in town, and I knew we threw away a lot of food, but what struck me more was that we pulled up in front of the State Department, and there was a long line of people outside in the rain waiting for this truck to pull up. And while the service part was rewarding, um, I, I, was, I was troubled because at the end of the line there was a, a gentleman, the driver of the truck, who knew everybody by name, and was saying, in effect, see you tomorrow night, see you tomorrow night. And I kept thinking, now what? I mean, shouldn't we do more? So I came back with a little plan. Frankly, it's a business plan based on FedEx, saying if you bring all this food to a central hub, you can feed more people better food for less money. But if you do job training, you, again, you can shorten the line by the very way you serve the line. But at its core, the kitchen only uses what's already there. And that's, that's kind of, I think, the launching pad for our conversation, because I'm the king of what's there. You know, what's already there? What do we waste sometimes just inadvertently, but sometimes out of tradition, you know? Talk about that. The tradition of nonprofits dates back to that, to the early part of the 19, no, oh, I should say it dates back centuries as yeah. we've been given, as people have always been, have been there to give alms to the poor. But more that idea is when Rockefeller and Carnegie started that idea. That yeah. nonprofit, that philanthropy idea. Was well, again, to your point, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's time immortal. I mean, there's, every faith has a tradition that says, in effect, here's how, you're our, our obligation to one another. But this is very deeply American, this thing we're talking about now, because no other country has a tax code that actually incentivizes its citizens to give to charities. And no other country volunteers at this level. And this really began, began in Cleveland with this kind of new industrial wealth that came. And you have this Carnegie Rockefeller model, which in effect says, I'm going to make a bunch of money in my life, and somewhere near the end I'll give some back to offset the damage I did doing, making a bunch of money in my life. And that, that model has been, again, it's time-honored and it's traditional, but with all due respect, there's not a lot of evidence that it works. I mean, good things happen. Every town should be justifiably proud of its traditions. Yet, we're still, I think, frustrated by the sense of why is there still such 
Why are, we, why are there more homeless people? Why is there more hungry? Why are there more people in prison, more kids in foster care than there ever was? So that's where I came from. It's like we have these problems that we really must deal with. I think as a, as a country, we're better than this. Um, but I became very interested in not saying, how can I get more money or build charity bigger? But is there another way to use what's already here to kind of liberate us a little bit from this charity trap? Let's talk about the charity trap. You're a charity, you get a grant. So you go through the process of filing the grant. And then when the grant goes away, you can't function anymore. So you're, you don't have a revenue stream as a profit business would have. How do you break that cycle if, 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 without changing philanthropy as we know it? Well, that's, 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 yeah, that's, that's, that's that what we got to do. Well, you know, it's funny because in the 1960s, up until about 1968, there were a very small number of charities in America, about 60, 70,000. And they were your traditional. They were the, 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 the YMCAs, the Bowery Missions, you know, the, 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 the Salvation Army, um, those kind of things. Um, and there was an explosion uh, of nonprofits in the 1970s and 80s to the point where now there's about a million and a half charities in America. And so it was interesting because there was a time in which America produced an abundance of, of extra. Um, you know, after World War II, we had the, thanks to the land-grant universities, the best agriculture system the world had ever seen. And our industrial base was completely unscathed, so we could actually rebuild the world on our washing machines and our, and our John Deere tractors. So that produced a huge amount of extra, which allowed the sector to grow somewhat unchecked. You know, it was more than enough money for everybody, anemic as it might be, for a lot of nonprofits to function in this kind of um, service model, where we fed the poor leftover food from restaurants, that kind of stuff. But that era is ending. And it's probably not going to come back. I mean, for a lot of different reasons, I don't think America's ever going to produce, or, and, and to use food as a metaphor, Americans were just uncomfortable throwing away as much food as we did. That's one of the reasons of the kitchen's success is I inadvertently touched this wild nerve. No matter who I talked to in Washington, D.C., there was this great sense of elation. Somebody's getting that food that was thrown away. That, those thousand eyes of pigs. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, you know, that's what it's me. We, we, this is deeply who we are as a people. It's important to who we are as a people, and quite frankly, it's, it's extremely important to our economy. You know, when you go around Boise or any town, what you see is this kind of yin and yang of traditional business and nonprofits. You know, you need arts, you need faith groups, you need education, you need a clean environment, you need all the things, quite frankly, that the Chamber of Commerce in most cities trumpet as, as one of the reasons you should make Boise your home or make Idaho a place for your business. It's the very things nonprofits produce. Uh, but we haven't really uh, kind of redrawn the lines and, and, and renegotiated if you will, the contract that says, in effect, we, we obviously need to move beyond the, the extra idea. Nonprofits don't have yeah, access to capital, and that's what interests me. Why have nonprofits been the poor stepchild in the economy? They're 10 percent of the economy. 11 million people work in nonprofits across the nation. Why is, why is I, think, I think you described it as um, the, I have to find, find my notes, a third class subservient station in America. Well, I'll be honest, it's a feminized sector. Um, it, it grew exponentially in the 70s, my mother's generation. Women were college educated in the 1950s and raised their family, proud mothers and wives. But in the 1970s, they said, in effect, it's, it's my time. I love being a mother, I love being a spouse, but I have skills, I want to go out and, and, and make my own way. And my mother is a classic example because when she went out, she was told, in effect, you're a housewife, you have no skills, go do charity. And that, that really, to me, that was an aha moment. Um, it was actually giving, developing a eulogy for my mother, because my father said, in effect, she was the CEO of a company. You know, he, he was a Vietnam-era um, helicopter pilot, was in Vietnam three times. He said, your mother bought and sold our homes, bought and sold our cars, raised six kids, started a soccer league. You know, but again, when she went out to get a job, she was told, you have, this is what you can be. So what happened is, I think, as a culture, we pushed a huge number, I mean, a frightening number of women into this role. Um, but what no one's really noticed is that sector has now grown to be the economic equivalent of India. Right. You know, the nonprofit sector, again, this is universities, churches, hospitals, synagogues, mosques, but if you pull it together, it is... It's a huge part of our economy. It would be the seventh biggest country in the, pl in the world yeah. if it was a country, but a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. <laughs> but we don't have a say in the smallest, towns, the smallest town's budgeting process. And that's the interesting process I'm in the middle of right now, is how do you help elected leaders understand that this this division between .org and .com that says, in effect, .coms drive the economy while .orgs do good deeds or, or kind of you know, clean up behind. I'm trying to, to in, in effect, convince people that that is a false and a antiquated and, frankly, dis not destructive, but dumb barrier, that if we liberate ourselves a little bit, we could actually potentially see a, a real flourishing of a different kind of business, the kind of business that, quite frankly, the 90 million young men and women under 25 who've been raised doing service 
really look for. There's a, a generation coming I speak of quite a bit. Again, this is the first time in the history of the world we've raised an entire generation doing service. Now, of course, Those millennials. Yeah. yeah, and there's 90 million recent census data. So what you've got is young men and women that on graduation day, every year in America, we say in effect, congratulations, choose. Do you want to make money or do you want to do good deeds? You know, do you want to be a dot com or a dot org? And that false choice at this very moment in our country's history, both economically and socially, is I think very, very, it, it's, it's limiting our options when it could in effect create this, this glorious hybrid. And that's what we at the DC Central Kitchen have been exploring with some of our revenue generating businesses, but what nonprofits all around America are exploring uh, today and right here in Boise. So if you were gonna, if you had the power to just change nonprofits, what would you do? Well, again, I, I'm a big believer in a, the idea of the deputy mayor, the lieutenant governor, that in effect, if you look at what goes on just in Boise, the amount of money that nonprofits bring in from outside the city or outside the state into the state makes it a huge investment, you know, a huge uh, source of investment. Yeah. So a smart mayor would have somebody on point that would say, in effect, maybe there's an opportunity here for organizations to collaborate, maybe some to basically combine and merge, but let's start to develop some partnerships that really attract the kind of funding that will make Boise stronger. Um, I'm and, very, I, and the whole, and Idaho. And Idaho, yeah, and this country. Um, I'm very interested in, again, new economic policies that might really spur the development, again, of these revenue generating models. I oftentimes say, if you had given Bill Gates $1,000 in 1986 when Microsoft went yeah. public, you'd have a half million dollars. You know, you and I would be down on, in the Basque neighborhood whooping it up tonight. <laughs> but if you gave the highest performing nonprofit in Boise and Idaho in the United States or in the world, I, I always used um, Muhammad Yunus's Grameen Bank, which is used micro loans to liberate yeah. almost 100 million women out of poverty with small loans. All you got was a one-time tax deduction. Now, why not an annual tax deduction with increasing value based on the same rate of return as a dividend check if an organization can show verifiable, measurable economic return. Well, let, let, one, of the, one of the things Congress is considering, the super committee is looking at, is eliminating that tax deduction for charities. What kind of impact, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Well, first, um, what's interesting about this is there's been no real analysis of what it might do. This is one of many pieces of legislation at the local, state, and federal level that is based on antidote. There's no in-depth analysis of what the sector does, which I find the fact that this is 10% of our economy really frightening that we spend this much money yet we don't have any sense of what a good nonprofit is. In fact, tragically, we've been led to believe that the great nonprofit is the one with the low administrative overhead, which we universally agree is really pretty intellectually limiting. But again, that's where we sit. Um, secondly, I gotta be honest with you, I don't think anybody's funding should be sacrosanct. At this point of our economy, we should have an all, all, all our, our, our cards on, on the table. The problem is the nonprofit sector is not at the table, and that's my only real concern, that decisions are being made, A, based on antidote, but in, in, in a democracy, we're not at the table. We've been told, and I think this is somewhat of a benchmark of the gender origins of modern philanthropy, that this is women's work, you sit over here and we'll make decisions and then you will have to deal with it afterwards. And I think that era, I find it just fundamentally undemocratic. And this is a big shift a lot of people are probably gonna be uncomfortable with. But I just don't think in a democracy you can allow what in effect is 10% of your workforce to not have a voice. I'll be honest with you, you and I can walk down the street on Main Street and every business can have a vote for sign in its window. I can't. Yeah, well, let me ask you that because we did, we, obviously this is a taped interview, um, so I'm, we're not taking our live phone calls, but I did get a Facebook question from someone who had kind of a specific kind of question. Uh, what advice would you give to nonprofits who have to sign agreements not to use grant money for political lobbying? And how, what do you suggest to help them with the bookkeeping necessary to track those expenses to preserve their charitable status? Well, A, I'm, I'm a big believer that there's, a, there's a, a lot you can do between the, the, the kind of line of demarcation of what nonprofits can or can't do currently and what we do. Right. There's, when I first started the kitchen, there was an urban myth that the health department wouldn't allow restaurants to right. donate food, that it was illegal. There was an urban myth. Similarly, <laughs> there's a similar urban myth that says nonprofits can't be political. Now, we can educate candidates and citizens a lot about what we do um, that moves well beyond the kind of moral good, bad, right, wrong and really starts to get into the economic smart dumb of what nonprofits do. And I, I use the kitchen as an example because our 80 graduates every year from our job training program, many of whom are felons, who would, if it weren't for this program, go back to jail and, and cost us collectively 45 grand to be in prison, they go out and they earn $2 million in new salaries. And of course, that has all the ancillary ripples that go along with paying rent, shoes, 
clothes and taking care of their own kids. But they're also going to pay in Washington, D.C., over $225,000 in payroll taxes. So, again, to help people understand that what we do isn't nice, this is an essential part of the economy. That's first and foremost. But I also suggest to nonprofits they have a lot of different options. For example, if the top 30 nonprofits in Boise got together and said, why don't we, why don't we, we pool our banking business, not our assets, but just our business, and let's go out to the banks and say collectively we have, and if you think about the top 30 nonprofits in this town, we're talking about a couple of million, hundred million dollars potentially yeah. when you think about the university. Imagine going and saying, look, we want a seat at the board. You know, you want our collective assets. You want us to put them through your bank. That's fine. We want a seat at the board. We want access to capital. No more having to be beholden to grants. Another thing I suggest constantly is nonprofits need to join the Chamber of Commerce. You know, we really need to, again, that's something we can do right now. We are major employers. We need to be at the table in the Chamber so that, again, as the city starts to think about its future, it's not done without all of its assets on the table. You make a good point in your book that, that nonprofits are not regulated by the whimsies of the market the way a profit-making business is. They're, they have other whimsies of grant right. funding cycles and that sort of thing, but, they don't, but because they don't have that, that tussle of the marketplace, you don't necessarily have the same kind of survival of the fittest corporation. Right. So there's a lot of nonprofits that just kind of eke along doing really good work, but working in isolation and working when perhaps it would be better to join together with something Yeah, else. I mean, there's no market forces that really propel us forward, and there's not standards that kind of unite us. So, again, what you get a glorious cacophony of good deeds, but not the consolidated kind of, and again, I, I'm not advocating that nonprofits suddenly become businesses, even though we are businesses. I don't, I don't say, in effect, if we all just act like business, it'll be polka dots and moonbeams, although there is a lot to be said for better efficiencies. Um, but, you know, what I want to see is move beyond is this anemic state in which we virtually all exist. And the reality is there's a thinning going on right now, whether we like it or not. You know, only now it's based on survival of the cleverest or pretty ribbons or things that I find really appalling. You know, we, we dole out research money for critical illnesses based on who's got the prettiest ribbon. You know, again, I just want to move beyond this, this understandable and historic but emotional side of what we do and interject just a little bit of sense of, look, this is a tremendous part of our economy. Let's really stop for a second. And, and think, if we've got 90 million kids coming out of school raised doing service. But equal, you know, I look at the baby boomers. Every single morning, 10,000 people turn 60 in America. Every single morning. You know, and this will be, in effect, the deepest well of life experience in the history of the world. Never before have we had an energy, an, a generation this educated, this rich, and this free, you know, who will live this long. So the question is, you know, what do we do? Do we make Meals on Wheels bigger? Do we build more senior, you know, uh, retirement homes? Or do we actually fundamentally talk about the role of seniors in our, in our economy, in our society? That's the flip I'm looking for. I, don't, I, I'm, I, I respect the need for services. But again, that first night I went out, I was serving. I was ladling out, you know, expensive soup to people in the rain. And, and while that's, it, it, there's a core that's, that's, that's beautiful and right and deeply American, I want more. As an American, I want more. You almost have to rethink how we view poverty and hunger in America when you rethink what and how nonprofits should operate. At the heart is you want to solve the problem why the person is homeless, not just give them a home. Right. You want to solve why they're hungry, not just, just give them food. But you still have to give them food and you still have to give them a place to live. Right, and I just try to do both at the same time. How do you reshape the general population's view on, on homelessness and social issues that the nonprofits are trying to solve? Well, to be honest with you, that's why I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I mean, you know, again, a chance to really, you know, go into people's homes in, in this great state and talk to them a little bit differently, maybe differently than they're used to, hearing about nonprofits. And I, quite frankly, there, were, there are those who think nonprofits need to act this way or there's, government must act this way, and I, I respect that. Um, I just grew up in a, in a country where there were, there were history books and civics books that, that, at least to me, said America is a better place than we have to feed working people. And that's really the face of hunger in America is that's, a single mom yeah. working two jobs, three jobs. And again, we can talk about all kinds of the issues of single moms and all that stuff, but the reality is at the end of the day, we're better than this as a country than to feed a working woman leftover food from a restaurant. As, as, as efficient and effective and cool as I can make it, that, that can never be our solution. So, but I believe that the way in which, as an example, we do our business at the kitchen can start to uh, illuminate and, and elevate this idea of, look, if, if we're buying, for example, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 from local farmers, so we're creating healthy meals that will have impact on our health care costs down the road. We're doing revenue generating businesses. We're doing meals on wheels. We're doing school food. We're doing catering. 
we're employing people and paying a living wage and full benefits to start. So we're starting to pioneer in a way, what does this new business model look like? And I think what's, what's, what's key to this idea is that the old model assumed that the, the, the kind of typical flow of the economy was that you know businesses kind of did these things, but the number one role of business is to make wealth for their investors, and that's fine. But that relies on consumers buying their product. And what you're seeing coming, predictably, is the age of the super consumer, who will say, in effect, I, capitalism, I like it. I just want capitalism 2.0. I want to know, I want a good cup of coffee, but I want to know that you're paying a living wage. I'm not going to ask government to tell you you have to pay a living wage, but if you want my money as a consumer, I'm not interested. I don't want to have to pay a very artificially low price for this coffee and then have the city have to tax me to pay for the charity for the employee who isn't making enough money there. I'm willing to pay the, the money for this cup of coffee, but I want more. See, I, I grew up in the food service industry. And when I was a kid, there were only 10 great restaurants in America. And every single one of them was French. You know, and what drove that explosion of, of culinary you know, excellence across America, there's great restaurants all over Boise. You know, where did that come from? It came from, it came quite frankly from reviews in newspapers that said good non I mean good restaurant, bad restaurant. I'd like that for the nonprofit sector quite frankly. You know, every day you can pick up a paper, good movie, bad movie, good video game, bad. I think that level of, of oversight for not just nonprofits, but all businesses. We are gonna very quickly, with 80 million people getting old, more than half women, we're gonna redefine what's beauty. What's a life? I'm all for that. Life? Yeah. Well, <laughs> everybody is, and it should be. But again, that's what's going to be fun. Is there's a predictable realignment of values that's coming. You know, all these people going to farmers markets. It's not because they're interested in food. They want community. They're hunting for something again. They want to belong to something. And there's a powerful economic, social, and frankly political opportunity here that a smart leader um, and smart um, business people will will not exploit but tap into. Let me, let me ask you about that, that community. How do you drive the charitable community to the philanthropy side, the giving side, to, to change the way they do business? So if you, because if nonprofits don't have a revenue, they don't have a way to, to right. create revenue. If I'm, if I'm working uh, on homeless pets and I'm trying to find, you know, that's my nonprofit charity, that's the goal I want, and how I can't figure out a revenue stream to sell, whether it's to you oh, know. you'd be surprised. I mean, I mean, there may be there, and that's could, it. How you do you train service dogs? Yeah, but how do you rethink the people who give the money to encourage nonprofits to rethink and move? This is what I'm interested in. Uh, now, again, this is rare, as we talked earlier. You know, to have this much time to have an in-depth conversation. Right. But I'm a big believer, and I talked to a lot of traditional media outlets, saying, in effect, look, there's 1.2 billion in cause-related marketing, and there's an army of readers that aren't getting any kind of information on where they work where I invest or where I spend my time, a lifestyle issue, where I volunteer. So there's an audience, I believe, for this kind of um, analysis. But I also, I believe that not only do we need enlightened consumers, if you will, um, as donors, but I'm very interested, again, in the, in the invisible hand of government. And again, I know that that's very tough for many people within the sector and outside to hear this, because again, most people kind of like it just the way it is. They, they can function, yeah. but I'm interested in this, this liberation, if you will. Again, for the people we serve, for, for our economy, for all these different things. So for me, deputy mayors are a fascinating opportunity. Again, that can use a subtle, but, but nonetheless invisible hand to say, in effect, look, we gotta get a better yield here. You know, whether it's taxpayers' dollars being spent or our community's long-term viability, we gotta pull this thing together here. We can't have thousands of group out there doing their own thing. So I can't tell you what to do, I, but here are some partnerships and some grant opportunities that would be really great if you partner to move together. And the reality is at the end of the day, you don't have to. I can't tell you what to do, but believe me, if you expect to thrive in this city, wink, wink, hint, hint, we need you to work together. That invisible hand, whether it's consumers saying, in effect, why would I give you money if you're not willing to partner? You know, I think that that will be great in the end for not the nonprofit sector, that level of oversight, which is kind of the double-edged sword. When I talk about our ability to get at the table, with those rights come responsibilities. And I think the, the, the country and our, our states would be better for the inclusion of the nonprofit sector in these debates, but I think the sector would also be better for the responsibilities that will come along with those rights. We're rapidly running out of time, and I want to give you a chance to make the same pitch you're making at the Nonprofit Center Conference. What are you telling those nonprofits that are here in Idaho that, that what they should be thinking about as we move into the next century? So we continue well, on. Into yeah, the I just say, in effect, look, again, this is, this is to be celebrated. You know, there's flowers blooming in every town. 
but there isn't the garden that we want or our community, our donors want, or our volunteers or anybody wants. If we haven't done it now based on the way we've done it, it's not going to happen. So we must be brave enough to let go of our comfort zone uh, and whether that involves um, exploring revenue generating, whether, it's, it, whether it involves sometimes transitional leadership. You know, there's a lot of founders who can't afford to retire. That's part of the one of the, the one of the kind of unintended consequences of this low administrative overhead. You have people who've given their entire lives, but they never put any money aside. So it doesn't mean you have to go away, but how do you let go and, and allow a younger generation, maybe with new ideas, and not just a younger generation, but those retirees who are coming in. I have met so many people within the nonprofit sector who used to work at Hewlett Packard. You know, and a variety of other businesses who in their 50s and 60s are saying, in effect, I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and work in a nonprofit. They're going to come with new ideas. So how do you help older leaders maybe open up and, and, and be willing to try new things. That's a, that's a big thing in of itself. But fundamentally, I, I really suggest that, they're, they're, that we can't allow any election to come up unless we, until we, we really work to educate the candidates and, and hopefully get some debates going about these candidates and their vision and how does it include the nonprofit sector in a way that makes Boise, Idaho, or this country a better place. There are a lot of nonprofits that just get very scared when you say, I'm going to get involved in an election, I'm going to get involved in a process. Any ad quick advice for someone who says, well, I know I need to do it, but I'm afraid I'm going to alienate my donor base if I even start. And it, I, I understand that, but I, you ask anybody, do you think just doing what we've done is going to work? And, and they'll, I guarantee, I, I've done this for most of my life now, in their heart of hearts, virtually no one will look, everyone agrees, yeah, we need to do something different. So, you know, this is where some of the some of the people that we really admire in America and that we have monuments in D.C. are people who really risked. And that's the, the real challenge for the nonprofit sector. It's one thing to genuflect in front of pictures of Dr. King or Mahatma Gandhi, but, you know, they, they went to jail. You know, again, I'm not, I'm not promoting, <laughs> you know, breaking the law, but, it, but it's just we have to be willing to step out of this comfort zone because no matter how hard we try, there's still people waiting outside in the rain, Americans. You know, our citizens sitting outside in the rain waiting for someone to drop by a meal. There's elders in this country, and their only hope of getting a meal, there's a waiting list for Meals on Wheels in half of American cities. Their only hope is someone dies. And that's just not the America I grew up in, and not the, the America I want to leave to my daughter. All right. I'm afraid, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you joining Thank us. Thank you very much. If you'd like to learn more about Robert Eggert and the D.C. Central Kitchen, you can go to our website at idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. I also invite you to become a friend on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in and join us here next time for Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.